Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardozo is the founder and dean of the David Cardozo Academy and the Beit Midrash of Avraham Avinu in Jerusalem and is a sought-after lecturer on the international stage for both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences and the author of 13 books. Rabbi Cardozo is known for his original and often fearlessly controversial insights into Judaism and his ideas are widely debated on an international level, on social media, blogs, books, and other forums. On a personal note, I had the great schus to learn with Rabbi Cardozo in Yerushalayim uh, in, his, in his wonderful fellowship, and to even uh, receive a, a, a Beit Midrash of Avram Avinu's uh, personal smicha, which is a great pride to me, to be a Talmud, to be a, a student of, uh, of Rabbi Cardozo. So thank you so much for taking time to talk. And thank you. you for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. So to jump right in, um, you know, uh, today people are, you're, you're weighing in on interfaith issues and halachic issues and, and the like, but I primarily think of you as a philosopher. And so let me ask you from the start, um, wh why do you think Jewish and even secular philosophy matter for Jewish life? What do you think the contributions are that can be made? If you go into a typical yeshiva or a kolel, they're studying halacha, the shach and taz, gemara, but you're not going to get philosophical ideas. Why do you think this is important? I think it is extremely important because it gives a much broader and wider understanding of what it means when we speak about the Jewish tradition and the mission of the Jewish people, not just to ourselves, the Jewish people, but to the sum total of the world. In my opinion, every kind of literature, Jewish, non-Jewish, even completely secular and perhaps atheist, is really a kind of uh, pirouche, a kind of commentary on the Torah. Why? Because the Torah itself is basically the blueprint of the world, in, according to the Jewish tradition. And if it is the blueprint of the world, then it means to say that the sum total of the world is somewhere included into that very Torah and into that very Jewish tradition. So there is nothing outside of it. And when we study Jewish or non-Jewish or even totally secular philosophy, it basically is giving us insight into what the Torah is trying to tell us. But the only way how we can find out is by not just studying Jewish philosophy, but also secular philosophy, science, whatever it is, psychology, and so on, because they are all related to that Torah or to that Jewish tradition. And I think our great challenge is, and that is not a challenge which we are very much living up to at this moment, is to bring all that information back into the Jewish tradition. That's not so easy to do. You, know, you need to know how to do that. But in my opinion, it is very possible. And more than that, it will give us a whole different dimension of what this Torah is all about. And it can only broaden our minds and it can broaden our understanding of that Jewish tradition. So therefore, the yeshiva learning which we have today, and you and I have both been involved in that for many, many years, is really much too limited to give us the full picture it only gives us a part-time or a partial picture, which I think to a certain extent even damages the image of the Jewish tradition, because how can you ever understand its beauty and its greatness if you don't have the full picture? And that is what is happening a lot today, and that is to our great regret. That's right. I think, I think your idea expressed through the book that you know well, what uh, Tamar Ross wrote in the name of Rav Kook, Expanding the Palace of Torah, the notion that Torah is exactly. greater by, our, by embracing wisdom. Today's ultra-Orthodox approach of rejecting uh, anything outside of a narrow purview, I think is not the authentic Torah approach, but rather embracing wisdom. As Rambam says, accept the truth from wherever you find it. So, um, yeah. you know, I think yeah. also... This is there, not about the greatness there of... There is even more to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, there is even more to it. There's a very interesting observation made by one of the great Hasidic thinkers, Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen, who was one of the major deep uh, philosophers of the Jewish tradition in the Hasidic world, who says that 
uh, when Yitro enters into the picture in the Torah as the son-in-law of Moses, of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he starts to teach him how to run uh, the, uh, his Beit uh, Mishpat, his uh, judicial uh, council, the Rabbi Tzadok and Cohen then writes because there is a lot of wisdom outside the Jewish tradition. Yitro is a non-Jew, he's a Gentile, and we need that information and in that way we can make that part of the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why Yitro is such an important personality within the Torah because that's exactly what he does for us. And if we leave that out and we say anything the Gentiles say is wrong, then we are basically making a point which is very anti-Jewish and also anti-Halachic. I could give loads of examples where Jewish tradition has made use of non-Jewish sources. Mm. So right through the whole of, uh, all of our ages and our centuries. But lately it has become an issue which suddenly is forbidden. But that is, uh, it reminds me more of the Catholic Church than it does of the, of the Jewish tradition itself. Right. And the notion of Chazal that we make a bracha when we see a wise Gentile. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. And this is not only about the greatness of Torah, the greatness of Torah, but also the greatness of the human spirit and the Jewish spirit, that not everyone is going to be, wants to study Talmud all day. Actually, there's many other ways to access Jewish thought in ways that are going to enhance the spirit and the mind. So let me move to our, our next question here. You know, I think of halacha as so expansive. If you ask the, uh, the, the typical non-Orthodox Jew today, halacha is narrow and out of touch and it's uh, bigoted. But actually, I think of halacha as someone who studied it for many years um, as something expansive and alive and dynamic. But that is not the, the, the mainstream Orthodox approach today. And I wonder, like, what's your vision for a 21st century halacha? Like, what could, how could halacha be brought back to life for Klai Israel at large? Well, first of all, I think what we need to understand is that halacha over the last 2,000 years has developed in exile outside the land of Israel. And that means in an artificial way. I think the sages of the Talmud and the Mishnah, which are all written outside Israel, and therefore in an artificial condition, basically had one thing in mind. How do we as Jews survive the exile, the exile, uh, let's say, experience, where we are surrounded with a lot of non-Jewish, often anti-Semitic attitudes, and we have to build very high walls to make sure that we survive this, till one day we are able to go back to Israel and be ourselves again. So what happened is that the whole of the halachic uh, evolution and the halachic process was more or less constantly focusing on how do you survive exile, which means to say that it basically got stagnated in doing the real job. And the real job is that it should be something where the halacha is to be liberated from its own uh, let's say, stagnating conditions which were created by the exile experience. And the point is, and therefore we are living in very unusual times, that for the first time in Jewish history, since the last 2,000 years, since we went back to Israel and we are an independent state and an independent people, we no longer have to deal with all the criteria of halacha as it was developed inside the world of exile. Because, let's put it in a different way, it, the halakha somehow uh, became part of what I call a waiting mode. It was waiting to liberate itself again, but it couldn't for one good reason, and that is that we were not in a condition to do, be able to do that. So it was waiting. It was uh, basically fearful of the non-Jewish world, how are we going to survive it as a minority under a very uh, large amount of animosity? But because we are back in Israel now today, we don't need to use that anymore as the criterion. And therefore we can liberate it, which is a long and difficult process by, by no doubt. But I think it can be done. But the biggest problem is that the establishment, the rabbinical establishment, doesn't see it like that, doesn't want to see it like that, is probably not even aware 
on what historically happened with the halakha in the last 2000 years. And that makes it hard. And one of the things which I am together with also rabbis, Israeli rabbis are trying to do is let's get out of this waiting mode. Let's get out of the stagnation, which it created for good reasons over the years, because it doesn't apply anymore to the new conditions. I always compare it to the Israeli army. The Israeli army is not just there to uh, secure ourselves in a way that we are fearful of the world, but if needed, we will attack. We will go out there and we will do what needs to be done. So the concept of pachat, as we call it in Hebrew, which means fear, is no longer part of the philosophy. As much as it is not the case with the Israeli army, it should neither be the case with the halachic way in which we deal or apply halacha. But let's be honest, the rabbinate in Israel, the establishment, is too, let's say, uh, fearful of this, doesn't want to go for this, probably doesn't know how to do this, and therefore it keeps on applying halacha as it was developed in exile, which is completely outdated when it comes to the question, how do you do this in the state of Israel or in modern times, which partially is also true about America. So if, if, if I can compare your first answer to your second answer to make sure I understand, part of your first answer was that secular wisdom and even Gentile wisdom is valuable for the Torah enterprise. Part of your second answer was that what has led halakha to be an stagnation is that it, 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 um, it existed in exile. And so um, what is it about the exile that put it into stagnation? Presumably it's not the Gentile influence. Is it the persecution? Or is it just that it's, pre, it's pre-modern? Is it that it's pre-Medina? Like, what is it about the, about the exile experience that has held uh, Halakha back? I think, first of all, like I said before, fear. Fear for the non-Jewish world, fear for the influence which the non-Jewish world will have on our children. And there is no doubt reason to be fear at that moment, because it is no doubt a problem. But by now we have outgrown this and we are strong enough to stand on our own feet and we are not prepared to do that. And therefore, it doesn't happen in the way it should happen. Great. So it is a combination of all sorts of different issues which came up in, in exile, which basically stagnated the, uh, the condition under which Halakha was able to, uh, to work. I remember that Rabbi Herzog, who was the first chief rabbi of Israel, wrote in one of his booklets, he said the halakha was not ready to take on Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel, because for the last 2,000 years we never developed an halakha for an Israeli democratic state, and perhaps I should say for an Israeli secular democratic state. Uh, and therefore, we have lost out on many issues which are of extreme importance. Great. So, so, so let's move to that last question. Um, what a bracha, what a bracha that we have um, autonomy and sovereignty and the chance of self-determination, uh, a chance that we know from history could be lost if we don't get it right. And so how can Torah now be relevant in 2019 uh, Israel? We know we have a Haredi faction which wants to push halacha down upon the rest of society. We have a Dati Laumi, a religious Zionist faction, which more or less wants to be left alone and to expand land. And then we have a Chiloni population, a secular population, which is so turned off by the Rabbinut and by the, by the force of religion being pushed um, that it wants nothing to do with it. How, what would a tikkun look like on a social level, but also how can Torah come to matter uh, on a broad, expansive kind of way in Israel today. We could talk about that for hours, <laughs> but what, what's your first... Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I would first of all say that one of the things which we have to bring back, back to ourselves and to our children, our students, is that the Jewish tradition is a mission. It is a mission not just to the Jewish people themselves, but also to the sum total of mankind. We are there to be an example to the rest of the world. One of the biggest problems in Israeli religious society and in the secular society is that many people ask, what, why is it so important to be Jewish? Just to serve ourselves? Just to look after ourselves? The answer is no. The whole point is that we have something to say to the rest of the world, to the Gentile world, which is of extreme great importance. And I think even that they are waiting for it. 
But the truth about it is that we do very little in our school system and definitely not in the yeshiva system. And we don't tell or speak even or discuss this matter at all. And therefore, many people are saying, in, including secular Israelis, why is it so important to be religious or to be really Jewish? Because what is the great picture behind all this? They don't know about the great picture because we don't teach it. We don't teach it in the secular community and we don't teach it in the religious community. So the first thing to do is to start speaking about mission. Before we start speaking about halakha and about all sorts of other things, is first to say, why are we Jewish? What is the meaning of being Jewish? And that particular point is nearly never discussed in any of the school systems, including in the religious school system, which I think is a scandal. And that is what needs to be dealt with. And then from there, you can go and show that halakha, Jewish philosophy, and all sorts of other dimensions of the Jewish outlook to life have tremendous importance, not just to us, but to the rest of mankind. Right. And the problem is that we are not doing anything of that. Right. Beautiful. Well, I so hope that is the first thing what, what, what yeah. needs to happen. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, there is something else as well here. Yeah. Can I add a few more words here? Yes, please do. Please do. Yes. Okay. We have to realize that the kind of halakha which we have today is built on the Mishnah, the famous Mishnah, and also on the Talmud. But we have to realize that both of these very important uh, concepts uh, are all an exile experience. They're built and they're created in exile. And what we really have to do is to realize that the halakha is depending on the oral Torah, on the oral law, which was written down partially in the Mishnah, and later written down in the Talmud and discussed in the Talmud. But some very great scholars who are not very much known in the religious world either. Uh, I mentioned, for example, uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Glasner, one of the greatest rabbis of the last century, who writes in his introduction to Masechet, to Tractate Chumlin, that we have to rediscover the real oral Torah. The real oral Torah needs to be all, can't be written down, can't be codified, because any codification basically means that you are storing things, that you are freezing things, that you are you don't give it the opportunity to grow and to become, uh, you know, uh, able to respond to the new conditions. So he says, and the other person who writes about that is Rabbi Cook, the famous Rabbi Cook, and also Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz. They all say the same thing. They're saying, let's go back to the original oral Torah, which needs to be oral and should not have been written down in the first place. Why it was written down was because we were thrown into exile, and if we wouldn't have written it down, it probably would have all been lost. But at the same time, it damaged tremendously the halachic process, because the moment you free something in a text, you can't develop anymore in a natural, organic way. And that needs to happen again. So we really need to go back to the days before the Mishnah and start to see what was there at the time as pure oral law, not written down. And from there, we have to rebuild the halachic system, which would mean that it probably will look very different from anything which we have now, which could also respond to the many new Israeli conditions which have been created by, Israeli, uh, by the Israeli uh, state for which the halakha, as it was written until that moment, was not at all yet ready. But the reason why it was not ready is because they started to codify it for the purpose of living in exile. But that's not the codification which we need in this particular country called the, 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 the Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel. Uh, there lies the big problem. I'm sure that many, and I know this from experience, if Israelis know that there is a whole different story behind that, which the rabbinate doesn't discuss and which the rabbinate doesn't basically stand for, the many would say, wow, that's unbelievable that we have this organic way of dealing with modern times, including secularity and including democracy, and that there is a Jewish response, a Jewish religious response to that. But there are only very few people are working for that and fighting for that. The majority is 
basically within the mainstream and therefore not at all open to that. And I don't think that they realize that there is a problem. Wow, this is uh, very inspiring, very crucial ideas to think about. Uh, friends, we hope you will um, follow uh, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardozo on, on Facebook and um, check out his amazing books um, and support the David Cardozo Academy online. And uh, this is, he, this is a, a person, uh, 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 my Rebbe, who has really pushed me forward in thinking boldly, who is rooted in Torah, but also thinking forward to honor HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the Torah and Kal Yisrael and the whole world. And uh, we wish you uh, so much success in your continued endeavors. And we're very grateful for this time uh, to learn with us. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Shmuley. It was great to see you again. Thank you so Hope much. to see you soon again in life. Be well.